So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies Service Through Policy Research In need of references for your research? Do you want a search engine that is easy to navigate? And do you want it free? If you are a student, researcher, or teacher looking for socioeconomic references and materials, then SERPI is for you. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website at www.pids.gov.ph and click the SERPI widget or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERPI is an online database of socioeconomic studies and materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies and other academic and research institutions. SERPI has a wide variety of socioeconomic materials such as journal articles, books, working papers, policy notes, research papers, and newsletters. SERPI has 52 partner institutions that contribute publications to the database. SERPI has a wide coverage of materials encompassing 20 research themes. You can search by keyword or author, by publication type, by research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 materials with full text that you can download for free. Enjoy searching! Visit SERPI now and follow us on Facebook. You may also send a message for inquiries. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan yung batas at polisiya para mas makita nila yung epekto at resulta nito. <sighs> Pag nangulit tayo, wala tayo may sasagot. Kaya dapat pag-aralan din natin. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan ng mga batas at polisiya para malaman nila kung epektibo ba ito sa karamihan o magiging problema lang. Kung walang basihan ng isang batas, basta na lamang ipatutupad at walang pulso na kinukuha sa mga mamamayan, eh, mahirap. Mahalagang isa ilalim sa masusing pagsusuri ang mga polisiya at programa ng pamahalaan bago pa man ito ipatupad. Dapat rin ipagpatuloy ang pagsubaybay o pagmonitor sa mga ito habang ipinapatupad hanggang sa matapos ang kanilang implementasyon. Dito pumapasok ang tungkuli na ginagampanan ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies 
ang PIDS, ang siyang sangay ng pamahalaan na naatasang gumawa ng pag-aaral at pananaliksik at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas at iba't ibang sangay ng gobyerno tungkol sa mga programa at polisiya sa pamahalaan upang masigurong matugunan nito ang socioeconomic needs ng ating bansa. Pag pinag-aralan, mas effective! So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socioeconomic think tank. conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies, Service True Policy Research. In need of references for your research? Do you want a search engine that is easy to navigate? And do you want it free? If you are a student, researcher, or teacher looking for socioeconomic references and materials, then SERPI is for you. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website at www.pids.gov.ph and click the SERPI widget or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERPI is an online database of socioeconomic studies and materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies and other academic and research institutions. SERPI has a wide variety of socioeconomic materials such as journal articles, books, working papers, policy notes, research papers, and newsletters. SERPI has 52 partner institutions that contribute publications to the database. SERPI has a wide coverage of materials encompassing 20 research themes. You can search by keyword or author, by publication type, by research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 materials with full text that you can download for free. Enjoy searching! Visit SERPI now and follow us on Facebook. You may also send a message for inquiries. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan yung batas at pulisiya para mas makita nila yung epekto at resulta nito. <sighs> Pag nangulit tayo, wala tayo may sasagot. Kaya dapat pag-aralan din natin. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan ng mga batas at pulisiya para malaman nila kung epektibo ba ito sa karamihan o magiging problema lang. Kung walang basihan ng isang batas, basta na lamang ipatutupad at walang 
pulso na kinukuha sa mga mamamayan, eh, mahirap. Mahalagang isa ilalim sa masusing pagsusuri ang mga polisiya at programa ng pamahalaan bago pa man ito ipatupad. Dapat rin ipagpatuloy ang pagsubaybay o pagmonitor sa mga ito habang ipinapatupad hanggang sa matapos ang kanilang implementasyon. Dito pumapasok ang tungkuli na ginagampanan ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Ang PIDS, ang siyang sangay ng pamahalaan na naatasang gumawa ng pag-aaral at pananaliksik at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas at iba't ibang sangay ng gobyerno tungkol sa mga programa at polisiya sa pamahalaan upang masigurong matugunan nito ang socio-economic needs ng ating bansa. Pag pinag-aralan, mas effective! Welcome to the PIDS webinar series. Before we start the webinar, we would like to give you a few reminders. For attendees, your microphone is muted upon entry. In case you have a question, the moderator will read it during the open forum. For those attending via Cisco WebEx, use the chat box located at the lower part of the screen. Click the chat icon, type your name and affiliation, and your question, and send to all panelists. You may send your questions while the presentation is in progress. The moderator will read them during the open forum. For Facebook viewers, at least two questions from the comment section will be read by the moderator during the open forum. We will moderate all questions to ensure that they are relevant to the scope of the presentation. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to your active participation. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the PIDS webinar series. We trust that all of you are safe and in good health. I'm Sheila CR, and I will be your moderator. Friends, uh, today we continue our conversation on the platform economy. So from social protection, uh, job security, and digital divide, we move to another very important topic, which is on regulations. So this afternoon, with the help of our resource persons, we will see how our current regulatory framework is affecting the growth of the platform economy and e-commerce in the country. 
to, op uh, to officially open our event, I, I now give the floor to the Vice President of PIDS, Dr. Marife Ballesteros. Peng, the floor is now yeah. yours. Thank you, Sheila. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before uh, we begin, let me first acknowledge the presence of officials from different sectors of society, from the government, uh, Director Jose Carlos Reyes of the Department of the ICT, uh, Executive Director Cesar Mancao of Cyber Cybercrime Investigation and Coordinating Center, House of Pre Representatives Director Julius Gorospe, Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department. We have uh, several participants from uh, CPBRD. We have the Executive Director Manuel Aquino, Executive Bureau Executive Director Novel Bansal, Director Elsie Gutierrez. From the Tariff Commission, we have Commissioner Ernesto Albano. From DFA, Vice Consul Adrian Buras. From the Again, from, from DFA, also from DFA, we have Executive Director Maria Duarte. From the Department of Finance, Director Sheila Castol Castalodi. From NEDA, Director uh, Florente Igtiben. Also from NEDA, we have OIC Director uh, Joseph Lalog. From the BSP, Managing Director Zeno Abena Abenoja. BSP Acting Director Deputy Director Bridget Romero, from the Land Bank of the Philippines, Assistant Vice President uh, Adarino, from Civil Service Commission, Director Noreen Gragas Gragasin, from the exec, uh, SEC, we have Assistant Director uh, Nolivien Ermitano, from the AP, Director Nika Salien, from UP Manila National Tele. Telehealth Center, Director Raymond Sarmiento. We also welcome uh, from PID, our PIDS board uh, member, Dr. Gilberto, Gilberto Lianto, and former PIDS president, um, Dr. Joseph Yeo. From uh, local um, government, uh, <clears throat> from the local government, we have local chief executive, uh, Vice Mayor Rolando Volante, of Manlilipot Albay. From the private sector, RCBC Director Cesar Virata, um, President Raquel Espina Bracero of the Philippine Association of Service Exporters, Mr. Bert Padilla, founder of TechWalk Digital, President Nick Fontanilla of uh, iMetrics Asia Pacific Corporation, Director Melissa Agabin of Chemonics International, um, in Information Technology and Business Process Association of the Philippines, Executive Director Ricky Salvador, Avant Consulting Managing Director Roberto Ortiz. Uh, friends from media, we also welcome our friends from media and from the academe, um, CEO Maria Lourdes Magdaso of, A of AIM, President Urduja Alvarado of CSU, Vice President for Administration and Finance, Alan Sakpa of Benguet State University. Vice President for Research, um, Ms. Teresita Narvaez of the Western Mindanao State University. OIC Vice President, Janet Ikao of Jose Rizal Memorial State University. Dean George Manzano of UAP. Dean Ross Alonso of Mater Dei Academy. Dean for Professional Studies, Amno Dennis Tirol of the University of Bohol. Bicol University Dean of College of Social Sciences, Alex de Pomoceno. Ateneo de Naga University Dean, um, Joshua Martinez. Polytechnic University of the Philippines Director, Angelina Borican. Southern Luzon State University Director, Melanie Cadal. And then from our CSO and NGOs and INGOs, we have CIMO uh, and Inotech Director Ramon Bacani, Foundation for Media Alternatives Executive Director Lisa Garcia, Masaganang Sakahan, uh, Director Danielle Agustin, 
Bankers Association of the Philippines, Associate Director Arnel Almaden, Philippine NGO Council on Population Health and Welfare, Executive Director uh, Eden Divina Gracia, and Executive Director Bai Anayatin from the Mindanao Coalition of Development NGO Networks. So uh, let me also greet our guests, colleagues from the government, academe, civil society, media, private sector, as well as those who are watching through the PIDS Facebook page. Uh, again, magandang hapon sa, sa lahat and welcome to our public uh, webinar. Digital platforms are becoming, as we all know, are becoming more and more important as the world continues to navigate the fourth industrial revolution. In the PIDS webinar last March, we mentioned several classifications of digital platforms as identified by the Center for Global Enterprise. We have transaction platforms like Grab and Uber, the innovation platforms such as the iOS and Android operating systems, integration platforms such as Google, Apple, Facebook, and Alibaba. We also have investment platforms such as Rocket Internet. So all these platforms have altered the way people live and work. They aid people, institutions, and businesses, both uh, big corporations as well as your SMEs, to innovate, become competitive, and sustain growth. Today, to this day, these platforms continue to be of great help as we face the worst public health crisis in recent times, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So as we look forward to the end of this pandemic and adopt to the so-called new normal, we think that these existing platforms will continue to innovate and new and in fact, new digital platforms will, uh, will also uh, emerge. According to the 2019 National Information and Communications Technology Household Survey, which was conducted by the DICT, 17.7% of households have their own internet access, majority of which use the internet for social media and communication. The results also showed that 43% of individuals have utilized the internet and the commonly used service device for accessing it is their cel cellular uh, phones. Only 19% use their laptop computer for internet access, while only 7% use their tablet devices for this purpose. In a, a study done by uh, Dr. Aubrey Tabuga of PIDS, she noted that the percentage of men using the internet is slightly higher than that than women at 48% and 46% respectively. Also, it was estimated that the magnitude for estimated magnitude for women without internet access is higher at 14 million compared to their male counterpart who are non-users of the internet. So as a way to improve internet connectivity and increase internet access and use, DICT has implemented some initiatives such as the free Wi-Fi for all program and the national broadband plan of the Department of Information and Communications Technology, both of which we heard in the last week's webinar. In the, I, I think that was in March, not last week. So, however, despite these initiatives, it is worth knowing if our existing laws, policies, and regulations are conducive to the growth of the digital economy. On the consumer side, it's important to ask whether users protect, are, are protected against data privacy and security issues, and whether transactions are done and, that, and whether the data that are, sh are shared, um, what are the security issues with regards to the data that are shared beyond our national uh, borders. So this afternoon, we are glad to have our, with us Attorney Aiken Larissa Cerzo, consultant at the University of the Philippines Law Center Technology 
and Policy Program, as well as a partner and head of the FinTech practice at the Dicini Butet Dicini Law Offices. Tony Serso will present two studies, one of which identified policy issues in the country's laws and regulations, and how this hindered the Philippines from participating in the global digital economy. Her paper discussed the implications of data protection regulations on the operations of digital platforms. Both studies provide areas for policy consideration and actions to boost the country's digital economy. We also invited resource persons from the private sector and government to give us a better understanding of how the regulatory landscape impacts the growth of our digital economy. I thank QBO Innovation Hub and Idea Space Executive Director Katrina Chan and Chief of the Mul Multilateral Relations Division of the Department of Trade and Industry Bureau of, Bureau of International Trade Relations, Ms. Marie Sherilyn Akia, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, with that, I look forward to the presentations and to a fruitful discussion of the issues. Thank you and have a good day. Over to you, uh, Sheila. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ballesteros. So friends, let us now listen to the presentation of attorney Lars Serso titled Cross-Border Regulatory Issues in uh, Philippine uh, Digital Platforms and E-Commerce. As mentioned by uh, Dr. Ballesteros, uh, this presentation was called from two research papers, both authored by attorney Serso. Attorney Serso is a consultant at the Technology Law and Policy Program at the UP Law Center, where she received her law degree. She is a partner at the Decini Law Office and heads the firm's FinTech practice. She also heads the firm's legal education and policy initiatives for Philippine startups. Her work as a lawyer focuses on FinTech, tech arrangements, uh, data protection, and emerging, emerging media. She regularly leads uh, regulatory, transactional, and corporate investment projects. She was cited as a next generation lawyer and next generation partner for technology, media, and telecommunications from, 20, 20, uh, from 2017 to 20, 2021 in the Legal 500. Attorney Lars, the floor is now yours. Sheila, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for spending your afternoon uh, with us today uh, in this webinar. Uh, oh, there. Share. Let me just share my slides. It's just loading. All right. Uh, I assume everybody can see my slides. It's all good, Sheila, from your end. Okay. All right, yes, so, my, okay. so my discussion this afternoon will be about the findings that uh, the findings behind uh, the papers that were published by, P by PIDs uh, late last year on digital platforms and e-commerce, particularly regulatory issues that are relevant to platforms in the Philippines or platforms which have operations uh, in the Philippines. So this focuses on various areas, fintech, uh, payments, consumer protection, etc., and data privacy. So the main goal of both papers is actually to provide guidance to government and policymakers when crafting policies and regulations that could affect uh, innovation as well as digital platforms in the country. So how is this? Uh, how is this done? Well, uh, first we look at the national innovation policy of the Philippines, uh, which is stated in various laws as well as the constitution. And then we assess how uh, specific regulations enacted to further said policies actually fulfill the policy objective stated in uh, the law and the administrative regulations. 
Uh, thereafter, we will also analyze how these regulations as well as policies are uh, in fact aligned with international standards set by various intergovernmental organizations uh, as well as groups. So as mentioned, so in the Philippines, we look at the national innovation policy when analyzing regulations. So the aim of this law is to is for government to place innovation at the center of its developmental policies and actually uh, explicitly implement a whole of government approach to ensure policy coherence, uh, alignment of priorities, etc. And really, the, uh, the goal is to uh, encourage coordination interaction among various stakeholders. So that's government, uh, the business sector, academe, uh, as well as the business entities or the platforms themselves in order to find out how regulations can work for innovation. And then uh, from a more zoomed out perspective, we, uh, the papers looked at the standards set by the UN, uh, the UNCTAD, specifically on how uh, developing countries uh, or at least developed countries can analyze their own innovation policies and find out how they can uh, implement reforms to be more supportive for platforms. So in like briefly, the UN suggests that each country implement a national strategy for innovation to, to ensure coherence. Uh, it also suggests that each country should adopt baseline e-commerce regulations that would be quote unquote friendlier for uh, platforms and innovation such as uh, regulation specific to consumer protection, data protection, intellectual property, cybercrime, particularly for transactions made through the use of ICTs uh, there. And then similarly, for data privacy, since uh, there was another paper focusing on data privacy, in terms of standards, we look at the OECD privacy guidelines, uh, which suggests that each country in order to uh, encourage development or innovation should set legal parameters for the processing of personal information. So that would include uh, implementing limits as to the collection and processing, ensuring that the processing of data is only done relevant to the stated purpose of each processor or controller, uh, that processors or that entities implement certain safeguards for data, and that accountability mechanisms be set to ensure that certain entities or persons are accountable uh, when it comes to ensuring the uh, enforcement of protection pr principles. Closer to home, we look at the APEC privacy framework uh, of the ASEAN, uh, of APEC, uh, which gives generally uh, general policy directives to instruct members to formulate domestic laws that would allow cross-border uh, transfer of data uh, and to implement, hopefully, intergovernmental cross-border rules across jurisdictions. Uh, relevant to this is the uh, APEC CBPR, or cross-border privacy rules, which is essentially a voluntary system, which members can opt into uh, in order to encourage greater cross-border transfer of uh, data. Uh, we also look at the WTO, uh, WTO recommendations, which recognizes that Although countries may implement measures to uphold privacy rights uh, and then gives as much leeway to, to each domestic country, uh, it says that each regulation or the regulations must not be implemented in such a way that it would act as trade barriers or it would encourage uh, discrimination across jurisdictions and thus lead to regulatory arbitrage. So in the paper, we did the survey of relevant Philippine regulations as mentioned, and we look at regulations affecting the, poly, the, the following areas. So general policy on innovation, we look at regulations that uh, affect electronic transactions, uh, payments and movement of funds, consumer protection, data protection, cybercrime, investment policies, as well as intellectual property rights. So we go straight to uh, the findings. So these are the regulations that are actually like the bright, the bright spots of our regulatory ecosystem now in the Philippines that are actually uh, friendly or beneficial to digital platforms and, and regulations that encourage electronic transactions. So as mentioned, we do have uh, a recently passed law, the Philippine Innovation Act, 
which uh, mandates that government, that all agencies consider innovation when coming up with policies and ensure that uh, uh, policies encourage entrepreneurship, etc. Uh, we also have the Innovative Startup Act that recognizes that uh, necessary for inclusive growth is the development of uh, MSMEs uh, and making them competitive, assisting them from incorporation to internationalization uh, through various ways. We also have various laws uh, seeking to uh, make doing business in the Philippines easier. So we have the Anti-Red Tape Act as well as the Ease of Doing Business Act. And then recently, the corporation code was revised in order to make it easier for uh, entrepreneurs and businesses in the Philippines to set up an entity with little to no capitalization and with uh, like one to two persons. We also have the national ID system, which uh, hopefully would make it easier for platforms to verify identity and therefore make uh, services, online services more accessible to the entire population. Uh, aside from these laws, we also have various policy declarations from different agencies like the DTI, the DICT, uh, yeah, and the, the Board of Investment, where they set uh, administrative roadmaps as well as guidelines for, uh, let's say, e-commerce and for the DICT, like a cybersecurity roadmap. Now, in terms of payments and movements of funds, uh, I think this is one of the brightest spot probably in our regulatory system. So the regulator here, the BSP, has been very proactive in issuing regulations and in implementing uh, various methods of regulations in order to encourage the growth of uh, business models that allow uh, cashless transactions and money service businesses. So uh, we have regulations, example, for remittance, foreign exchange, e-money, and I think we're one of the first countries to formally allow or formally regulate virtual currency exchanges, uh, now called virtual asset service providers. Uh, we also have a national QR code standard, which seeks to make, uh, which seeks to integrate or make it easier for consumers to use payment systems of uh, various companies. And then there's also a rule for all entities that provide electronic payment and financial services that for them to provide that they must commit to integrate with the uh, automated clearinghouse and thus again make it easier for people to transfer money in and out of various wallets or various bank accounts. So like we have Instapay, Pesanet, etc. And then uh, it's also interesting how the BSP can uh, also take a light touch approach when it comes to regulating quote unquote new business models. Uh, in sort of a parang wait and see approach in order to for them to better understand the business model. I think that's how it's happening now with the operator, the regulations for payment systems. Uh, instead of a licensing procedure, they just implemented uh, an online registration for uh, for all operators of payment systems. Uh, and the application time is fairly short for that. Uh, aside from the BSP, the DTI also has its own regulations for payments. Uh, which allows for gift checks and gift credits. So there's no licensing requirement for that. Uh, and of course, the SEC comes in when your virtual assets or tokens take the form of securities. Now for consumer protection, uh, although our law, uh, our Consumer Act was enacted back in 1993, uh, these regulations have been updated uh, through the E-Commerce Act and the Cybercrime Prevention Act which basically states that the regulations for consumer transactions uh, in the analog world would apply to consumer transactions in the digital space. And then the Cybercrime Prevention Act also makes it makes certain offenses or certain acts criminal, uh, imposing heavy penalties and thus disincentivizing uh, bad actors in, in the digital space. The BSP also has specific consumer standards uh, for the providers of financial services. So for example, providers must disclose uh, certain information or relevant information about their products. They must disclose how to make complaints, how to reach the regulator, etc. Now, in terms of uh, cybercrime, uh, as mentioned, we have uh, enacted or we have a Cybercrime Prevention Act in place, which uh, defines certain offenses uh, certain offenses and provides heavy penalties for that. Uh, in addition, the Cybercrime Prevention Act also in, uh, also makes certain offenses 
that were existing before the law, uh, cybercrime, when these are done through the use of ICT devices. So, for example, if you commit a staff through the use of computers, of devices, that's elevated into a cybercrime, uh, thus carrying uh, heavier penalties similar to, let's say, falsification, forgery, etc. In terms of law enforcement as well, the Cybercrime Prevention Act empowers law enforcement agencies uh, by giving them more tools to enforce the law. So uh, recently, the Supreme the Supreme Court issued the rules on cybercrime warrants, which uh, gives law enforcement agencies and the courts uh, the ability to allow law enforcement to, let's say, uh, search and seize uh, data stored on ICT devices. Yes, and then it also gives an obligation or it also obligates uh, platform platforms, service provide, uh, service providers, etc., to store certain types of data like traffic data, subscriber data within their systems for a certain period of time before deleting them. So the idea is uh, if someone makes a complaint against a platform or against another user of a platform, law enforcement agencies uh, should be able to ask the platform or demand the platform to cooperate. Now, for intellectual property rights, so generally uh, our regime or IP, IP regime is uh, pretty much uh, in line with international standards. So the country is a signatory to various treaties, uh, allowing local inventors and creators to protect their rights, uh, even offshore. So uh, as for software codes and other creative works, uh, the inventors can protect this through copyright. Uh, other products and solutions may be protected through patents. So there's a study by the GII, uh, which is published by the uh, by Cornell, NCAD, and WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Office, which actually uh, gave the Philippines its highest rank, I think, last year, uh, its highest rank ever due to the increase in uh, the filings for utility models and patents. Uh, I think they're, uh, based on the study, the rack just was just uh, pulled down a bit due to difficulties when it comes to complying with other regulations aside from IP. However, uh, the IPO has made it easier uh, in the past year uh, for inventors to file uh, protections for utility models, trademarks, etc. Now, for data privacy, the local law, the Data Privacy Act, provides a relatively broad scope of protection for personal information uh, processed in the Philippines, whether it be the information of uh, foreigners or Filipino citizens. And then the law also extends the coverage of the protection to processing activities done offshore outside of the country, as long as the processing involves a Philippine citizen and a Philippine resident. Of course, there are certain exceptions, uh, but the baseline general rule is that all processing of personal information, whether this is done by a big company, a small company, so your Sari Sari store or your uh, individual professionals, these are all covered by the law. So this is very different from the privacy regulations, let's say in the United States, which, uh, which only applies to certain entities uh, that reach a certain income. Now, generally for, so processing, when we say processing, that includes collection, storage, sorting, sharing, etc. Uh, generally, for any person slash entity to process personal info, uh, the there must be legal basis. And for platforms, for platforms, the most prudent way is to get consent, to get the consent of the data subject. Now, when we say consent, it's not just merely getting a yes. Uh, the platform must provide the following information. So the description of the personal info that you collect, how you process it, who you can share it to, uh, whether you implement certain automation uh, mechanisms. You also must inform the data subject about his or her rights, which is enumerated in the law, uh, as well as the period for processing and any uh, policy when it comes to deletion, etc. Now, in terms of accountability, so who has to comply? Uh, it has to be the personal information controller. When we say controller, that's the entity entity that decides what to do with the data. So in the context of digital platforms, that would be the platforms themselves. Uh, 
unless of course they are merely subcontractors for another entity. So in all cases, the controller is responsible for getting consent for ensuring that and for ensuring that the data privacy rights of the data subjects are respected. Uh, so if let's say a controller shares the data to a subcontractor, let's say an, uh, a marketplace platform shares the data to a logistics uh, entity, if there's a breach with the logistics entity, the accountable party would still be the uh, online marketplace. So that's the basic rule. So even you can share it offshore, but the controller would be liable for that data. So that makes it easy for data subjects to uh, to seek redress against uh, when it comes to data privacy violations. So it's important to note that the law actually makes it criminal uh, when a controller or when a person processes personal information without authority or if it conceals any security breach, uh, etc. So again, this is unlike other data privacy regulations abroad, uh, wherein violations are mostly just uh, met with civil penalties like fines or administrative sanctions. So again, when it comes to cross-border transfers, naman, uh, there is no prohibition in our law uh, against offshore transfers. The only requirement again is that generally the data subject must be informed about the fact of transfer since transfer is still processing. And then if you, again, if you transfer it to a subcontractor or whatever, the standards for outsourcing or data sharing as provided in the law and the regulations uh, must, be must be followed. So if you're the controller, you must make sure contractually uh, or technically that your subcontractors are compliant with Philippine law. So that in the event of an audit or a complaint, you can demonstrate that uh, you and your subcontractors are actually compliant with the law. So that takes, uh, that would entail certain resources. And also, uh, this is also without prejudice to the application of other regulations. So for example, the BSP, the DOLE, as well as the BAR, uh, in case they do an audit, if your data is located offshore, they, those data, like those storage facilities, uh, whether it's been in the cloud or on-premise, must be auditable to the regulators. So what's the effect of so data privacy? Uh, the existing regulations actually build trust with regulators and consumers since data subjects are given more transparency and more control over how their data should be. Well, theoretically, they're given more control over how their uh, data could be processed and they can make uh, demands for, let's say, correction or for withdrawal, uh, etc. Now, in terms of uh, risks uh, or the gaps in our regulations, so we've, we've identified several uh, issues. Number one, when it comes to contracting, although our regulations uh, recognize that analog contracts and electronic contracts are the same or are equivalent, there are certain uh, kinks. So for example, if you want a document notarized, there is currently no way to completely remotely notarize it. Uh, you can notarize it electronically, meaning you do it by a video conference, but the document itself, the physical document, would have to be uh, passed to the notary public and then back to you, et cetera. And then for uh, telco, telcos, uh, if you look at our telco regulations, the way that the regulations on uh, public telco companies and value-added service providers, vast providers, the way that uh, these are written, it seems to cover, or it actually covers uh, providers of products, software products that provide content or advertisements or provides ways to communicate. So if you read that definition, uh, technically most platforms and most like mobile applications and software solutions are actually uh, vast providers and that requires, uh, that requires registration with the NPC prior to actual operation. And aside from that, uh, vast providers are generally treated as public utilities and therefore subject to uh, the foreign equity restrictions, which is 60-40 for public utilities. Now, for investments, uh, for investments, uh, we've identified certain uh, 
restrictions that are found in our constitution as well as our as various laws that would actually apply to digital platforms. So these are the restrictions on mass media, advertising, retail, uh, public utilities, and education. Now, uh, I think most relevant here would be uh, on mass media. So the restrictions for, for mass media that's found under our constitution, it says that only Filipinos and entities that are 100% owned by Filipinos can engage in mass media. Now, what mass media is, is not defined in the constitution. It's defined in various laws. So the Consumer Act, it says that mass media is uh, any activity that involves the communication of advertisements to the public through the use of TV, radio, uh, and newspapers. And then uh, the Tobacco Regulation Act back in 2003 extended this to include uh, advertisement communicated through internet, through the internet. Now, uh, that's fine. However, since the early 2000s up to 2018, there has been uh, various issuances from uh, the, the SEC and the DOJ defining mass media. And the opinions have been formulated such that internet platforms and internet businesses have been characterized as mass media. So for example, a an online platform that provides information regarding vouchers uh, was was declared to be mass media. Uh, another entity that provides technology that could be used by 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 customers to communicate uh, to communicate messages, uh, even though that entity did not create the message, uh, has been declared to be engaged in mass media. So various pronouncements such such as such as those uh, have basically uh, set up a rule wherein if you're an internet business communicating any message to the public, whether or not you're the author, whether or not you're the author of those messages, uh, is, uh, is mass media, the subject to the to the foreign equity restriction of 100%. Now, if you take those rulings, uh, any website, any mobile app uh, could be classified as mass media. Although, uh, interestingly, back in 2018, uh, back in 2018, the SEC, I think, slowed down a bit with those series of opinions uh, when a platform asked for an opinion whether uh, their platform, which allows financial institutions to display products on the site, whether or not it's mass media, the SEC did not make a uh, pronouncement. Instead, they gave certain guidelines. Uh, like, for example, uh, ads should not be... Uh, ads should not be prominently displayed, uh, information should be limited to the services of the platform, etc. Now, uh, that's a, a good turn by the regulator. However, that would still make all websites that publish ads, which I think most websites do, uh, as mass media. And uh, this would limit the ability of uh, platforms to obviously get funding. So, so I think mass media out of all four is the most controversial right now. Uh, for advertising, that's 70 30. Uh, 70 percent should be 70 percent Filipino, and it covers entities that uh, are involved in the creation of messages or the conceptualizing of uh, of ads, uh, not the publication. Not the publication. Once you publish your mass media. Now for retail, uh, I won't discuss this too much since uh, I believe there's a there's an ongoing bill. Seeking, seeking to liberalize uh, liberalize retail. Uh, so what I can say here is that right now, retail is technically liberalized. However, the threshold that one should meet, that a foreign retailer should meet before it can do retail in the Philippines is quite high. So it's $2.5 million. Uh, plus it must have five, re, five exist, it must have a retail experience of five years uh, all over the world. So those are some of the uh, requirements, which if you uh, think about it, are not really applicable to retailers that are purely digital, since uh, most retailers would not have existed, at, at least right now, would not have a fi five-year history and might not have uh, branches, which is one, one more requirement, you must have branches. Uh, for public utility, this is relevant only because uh, the definition of public utility extends to tech enablers, uh, such as uh, ride-sharing platforms, uh, which right now uh, they're required to be 60-40. Uh, 
And then for education, uh, if you read the definition, like education and public utility, the restrictions are provided under the Constitution, but the definitions are provided in the law. So for education, it covers uh, formal education as well as technical and vocational courses. And if you read the definitions, uh, it would technically cover platforms that provide training online. Uh, although there is uh, right now an exception in the 18th and 11th negative list uh, where the president said that uh, education platforms or entities that provide short-term and high-level skills training are not part of the uh, are not part of the education system. Uh, however, right now there's still no clarity as to what constitutes short-term and high-level skills. So uh, we're not sure if, like, for example, entities like Coursera, etc., are covered by the restriction. Now, aside from aside from those issues, uh, another regulatory gap would be the existence of regulatory overlaps when it comes to the regulation of certain products or services. Uh, now, of course, the nature of tech products is that eventually they end up uh, providing various services, right? For example, it may be providing you with payment services, logistic services, information services, etc. So necessarily, uh, it may fall under the jurisdiction of two or more regulators. So for example, uh, we've mentioned a while ago, virtual assets or virtual tokens, uh, if these are uh, virtual assets under the definition of the BSP, then you're regulated by the BSP. However, uh, the DTI also regulates gift checks, which is like the virtual representation of value which you can redeem to purchase products and services from stores uh, there. And then once it takes the form of securities, uh, it, uh, it goes under the jurisdiction of the SEC. So I think the, the distinction between a virtual asset that's not a security and a security uh, is quite, uh, it's not that big. We have guidance under the law. However, if you're an issuer of a virtual asset, uh, there has to be some more clarity as to the steps that you would take in order to determine whether you should go to the BSP or you should go to the SEC uh, to avoid any situation wherein, let's say, one regulator has already cleared you uh, but while you're already implementing your business, another regulator might come after you. So same thing with the transportation sector. Uh, this is interesting because uh, public transport in the Philippines is uh, regulated by the LTFRB. However, if you read the rules, they only regulate uh, four-wheeled vehicles uh, and not two-wheeled vehicles and not three-wheeled vehicles. So if, for example, if you're a tricycle, you don't actually go to the LTFRB, you go to the LGU. And then if you're, a, let's say, a motor motorcycle taxi, right now it's uh, there's a gap in the law. You're technically not regulated by anyone. So aside from overlaps, there's also uh, the problem of regulatory divergence when it comes to data privacy. Since uh, although the Philippines uh, allows the, allows uh, cross-border transfers. Uh, technically, if you, let's say you're a controller in the Philippines, you transfer data to Malaysia or in Indonesia, uh, under Philippine law, you're required to comply with Philippine law. However, uh, there are instances where you will also be required to comply with the minimum requirements in the destination country, like Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, etc. And uh, the thing is, the regulations either are divergent. The basis for legal, the legal processing of data differs from one country or uh, to another. So some jurisdictions, uh, the basis for legal, legal processing is consent, uh, so that you can transfer one data from here to there, or from their jurisdiction to to wherever. Uh, in some jurisdictions, aside from consent, the destination country must also be part of some uh, white list issued by the regulator. So if you're a platform, you must do some, some level of due diligence to identify what regulations actually apply to you. And of course, to engage uh, the services of a lawyer or, or compliance services in the jurisdictions where you operate. Now, uh, I mentioned that there's an APEC cross-border uh, privacy rules in place right now. However, uh, as of the moment, only two parties actually opted in, and that's 
uh, the Philippines and Singapore. Uh, the other countries uh, have not signified any intention yet to join. So that's one issue that we have, uh, that digital platforms have to work with. Uh, if they wish to have cross-border operations or if they want to expand regionally. No. Uh, in terms of the effects on platforms, uh, for data privacy, uh, we'll tackle this first. Uh, obviously, due to the requirements of our local privacy regulations, uh, there will be an increase in the operational and compliance cost of the digital platform, uh, which is necessary for them to be able to comply with the transparency and aut uh, autonomy requirements of the law. Uh, again, uh, the data subject must be informed about everything that happens to their personal info, which requires granular processing audits by the digital platform, which is a good thing because, again, uh, platforms are forced to rationalize the way that they process data, uh, are forced to conduct privacy impact assessments, and hire a data protection team. Uh, but then that comes with, with cost. And uh, as mentioned, the divergent regulations across the region uh, could act as a non-tariff trade barrier uh, between countries uh, due to the compliance costs required of comply required if you want to comply with uh, the all jurisdictions, the regulations from all jurisdictions. Uh, and now you're forced to decide if you're a platform whether you want to have any activity in a country that may uh, impose higher or more burdensome regulations as opposed to another country with lower regulations. Uh, yeah. As to the effects on data subjects, uh, it's, it can be argued that the Data Privacy Act and privacy regulations, uh, although it it empowers individual data subjects by giving them more information about their data. Uh, given that ours is consent based, this would, in order to comply with the data, you just need to have, well, you hire a lawyer or a compliance team, and a platform can end up having very long consent forms and privacy policies. Uh, however, whether the policies are actually read by the data subject is another question. So it might give uh, some false sense of control over the data. And I think uh, cog cognit cognitively, uh, it may be unreasonable to expect a data subject, uh, a layman, a normal consumer, to actually uh, understand the language of consent forms and to make a an informed decision at the moment that those consent forms are forwarded to them, which is when they need the service. So that's one thing. Now, so uh, impact. Uh, so the regulations, the regulations that we have are those, the gaps that we identified uh, may have some impact on the ability of platforms to raise funding or to get funding, uh, especially in the context of the Philippines and ASEAN. So uh, for platforms that want to compete with global startups that have already enjoyed first mover benefits, as well as the network effects of uh, digital platforms, uh, these local startups would have to take advantage of uh, setting some market differentiation or developing new products, which would definitely entail or require extensive capital, uh, extensive capital from from these local startups. Now, uh, with the difficulties or the uncertainties presented by what we've discussed in the previous slide, like investment restrictions, regulatory overlaps, etc., uh, these may be a disincentive for startups to either uh, locate here or have operations in the Philippines. Now, uh, various studies by the ASEAN, the UN, OECD, as well as uh, private entities like Google and Temasek uh, revealed that funding problem is definitely a regional phenomenon across ASEAN. But if you compare the ASEAN countries, the Philippines is still uh, performing worse. Uh, compared to other countries in the region in terms of the size of the M&A deals that are happening locally, as well as the number of M&A deals. So just to give you an idea, uh, there. So in Google study, the Philippines actually ranks behind Singapore, Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, 
in terms of the deal size and the number of M&A deals. So this is from a 2019 uh, study. Now, aside from funding, uh, the compliance issues may also be a disincentive for uh, compliance-driven platforms and would affect their ability or their desire to roll out products uh, in the country. So to cite as an example, uh, not, not close to home. So for example, uh, Amazon's experience in the United States, uh, when it launched its drone research, it did this in the UK due to uh, what was cited before was the uh, very strict requirements in the US uh, before one can get a permit to fly drones or to get a permit to conduct drone research. So all of their operations were transferred in the UK. They eventually transferred it back when the US relaxed its regulations when it comes to drone operations. Uh, in the Philippines, we saw how this worked uh, with, you know, with CESA, although probably it happened, uh, it, it's, you know, it's the other way around. So CESA back in 2016, 2017, issued regulations allowing virtual currency exchange uh, offshore virtual currency exchanges to operate in CESA. Uh, and they, the CESA provided a licensing, like licensing rules for them. And then uh, eventually uh, several, several offshore companies decided to set up in CESA, even paying the relatively high uh, cost for the licensing, uh, for the license as well as the investment requirements. And I think that shows that if the regulations are clear, uh, platforms are willing to subject themselves to regulations uh, since they can treat this as a uh, as a, some sort of market like a marketing strategy uh, where they can say that they are compliant uh, they have a government agency auditing them or looking after their operations uh, in a negative Linaman, uh, we see how this affected the rise or the growth of ride hailing services in uh, the ASEAN. So, for example, in Malaysia and Indonesia, they had problems, Gojek had problems launching their services in both countries due to the absence of regulations actually allowing motorcycle taxis. Uh, but eventually, uh, once the regulator decided to, to formulate regulations allowing for these services, uh, those regulations eventually, or those services eventually uh, took root and then grew and eventually expanded regionally. Now, uh, another effect of the regulatory gaps we identified is how it leads to regulatory uh, arbitrage. So this happens when uh, entities, uh, due to the regulatory risk and uncertainty in one jurisdiction, let's say the Philippines, uh, are encouraged to locate in other areas or jurisdictions where risk is more manageable. Or uh, other than that, it also refers to instances where uh, a platform could redefine its activities or its structure in order to take advantage of less stringent regulations within a single jurisdiction. Okay. Now, to illustrate how this happens, uh, for cross-border regulatory arbitrage, like, right? So we've identified three main uh, three main trends. So first, absolute relocation. This happens when a Philippine-based platform decides to locate and operate in an offshore jurisdiction completely, and basically leaves its leaves the Philippines. It has no it no longer has any ties here. It has no operations here, uh, and they may be driven by uh, by by the desire to operate in a more Friend, in a friendlier, uh, friendlier jurisdiction where uh, compliance is, where regulations are more certain. So another, another trend would be hub relocation. And this happens when a platform relocates its head office in a preferred jurisdiction, but maintains presence in the Philippines in order maybe to take advantage of certain regulations that could be favorable to them. So an example here would be, let's say, uh, a digital platform transfers to Singapore in order to enjoy the lower tax rates there and in order to enjoy uh, yeah, the lower tax rates there and maybe uh, regulations that could legalize or formally legalize its operations. However, uh, these platforms may still uh, retain 
limited operations in the Philippines, mostly for, uh, let's say, development work, uh, support services, back office operations, uh, tech support, etc. Uh, due to the fact that uh, wages or salaries may be lower in the Philippines, uh, and they don't need to compromise on uh, the skill level of workers. So uh, this is okay. However, one effect of this is the entities which are retained in the Philippines are limited to providing services to the principal company offshore. So it's questionable whether uh, such activities actually contribute to uh, innovation in the country since these entities don't engage in, let's say, product development, uh, etc. Now, the third one, uh, which is the most, uh, the most, uh, the trend that could be most harmful to the Philippines is when fictional relocation happens, uh, which is when a platform does not decides not to organize in the Philippines at all. It doesn't register a business here, uh, an entity here, and still does business in the country. So, uh, an example here would be, let's say, a social media platform operating purely offshore. It has no presence in the Philippines. However, uh, consumers and users in the country can still choose to avail of the services of that platform uh, and let's say buy features, uh, buy goods and services, uh, thus allowing an entity not organized in the Philippines or not paying taxes in the Philippines to still enjoy uh, our market and enjoy revenue here. Now, aside from uh, those instances which uh, involve some cross-border elements, regulatory arbitrage could also happen within the Philippines uh, due to certain regulatory gaps. So this happens when uh, uh, this happens when platforms uh, take advantage of certain gaps. Let's say if you're a virtual asset provider which allows payments, which where you allow people to use tokens for payments, you might characterize characterize yourself as a gift check instead of a virtual asset under the BSP rules in order to evade licensing requirements. Now, for we go to the policy considerations. <clears throat> now, uh, given all of given all of those, given what we've discussed, the paper suggests that the uh, following be undertaken. So, regulators and policymakers should reevaluate re re objectives behind restrictive policies and assess whether these regulations are aligned with the stated objectives. So, for example, most of the investment restrictions we have uh, were actually written decades ago and may have to be reconsidered in light of the existing technology these days and in light of the fact that the harms that ex existed long ago may not, not, uh, may not be uh, relevant today. And then uh, the paper also suggests that uh, regulators make use of regulatory intersections instead of doing away with it completely, since each regulator presumably has an expertise, uh, has its own expertise, and redund redundancies could create regulatory safety nets. Uh, the goal is to avoid duplication, which could be uh, wasteful. Yeah, and then uh, the paper also suggests that. The regular assessment and reassessment of regulatory intervention should be continuously studied uh, in order for policymakers to uh, determine what type of approach to take in order to address a specific uh, issue posed by regulatory uh, gaps. So, in some cases, it may be better for regulators to take a wait and see approach in cases where, for example, they want to study the technology, but they don't want to hinder the innovation that could happen. Uh, in some instances, it may make sense to take preemptive actions against uh, innovation that could potentially be harmful to the public. Uh, in some instances, it may make sense to take a light touch approach where regulators instead issue best practices or guidelines instead of uh, implementing uh, ex ante regulations. Now, for closing, uh, I think what the paper says basically is uh, regulatory frameworks definitely play a key role in driving digital platforms. Uh, and these must be re-evaluated re uh, in order to make sure that these are aligned with the country's own innovation policies as well as uh, policies 
sent by policy sent uh, issued by other intergovernmental organizations, uh, which we are a party to. Aside from uh, looking solely domestically, we may also need to look at uh, implementing or pushing for intergovernmental regulations or cooperation uh, for areas such as uh, data privacy. I think that's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Attorney Lars, for your uh, very clear, uh, comprehensive and in insightful uh, presentation. Really, your slide on uh, regulatory arbitrage shows the unintended consequences of uh, having too much regulations. Um, just recently, uh, I just recall that the president has certified three economic bills as urgent, and among these bills is the Public uh, Service Act. So hopefully this move by the president could give our le uh, legislators the much needed push no, to fast track the deliberation and finalization of this pieces of legislation. So I'd, I'd like to uh, get your uh, thoughts on this uh, during the open forum. So friends, uh, at this point, let us hear what our uh, discussants have to say about uh, the presentation of attorney Lars and their, and their insights from the standpoint of the sector where they belong. So I invite you to listen to um, the voice of the startup community from our first discussion. We hope uh, to hear from her uh, the challenges that they face uh, and her insights on how to address the issues impeding the growth of our start startup ventures in the country. Our first discussion is the executive director of Kubo Innovation Hub a public or private initiative which she launched in 2016 to develop the Philippine startup ecosystem. She also heads uh, Idea Space, a leading corporate accelerator and early stage fund. Uh, she advocates for spurring innovation and technopreneurship as an engine for driving economic growth and competitiveness for the Philippines. Uh, our discussant completed her bachelor's degree in material science and engineering with a double major in business administration at Carnegie Mellon University. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Executive Director Katrina Chan. Director Chan, the floor is now yours. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank Good you, afternoon. Lars, for that presentation also. Um, let me share my screen and... Let me know if you can see it. So, yeah, so hi everyone. I'm I'm going to try to react or give my thoughts on um, Attorney Lars' presentation um, in the context of, I guess, my on-ground experience working with startups. Um, as mentioned in the intro, I am Kat Chan. I hope everyone's doing well and staying safe. I think the most important thing to know about me is that, you know, I'm currently working in, in my wearing my Kubo and Idea Space hats um, with over 500 startups, that um, a lot of them um, digital platforms actually or digital first, um, and that one of our big things is also working um, working with um, Ernie Lars and um, Dicini Law on you know in assisting a number of startups. So anyway, today I am sharing a few thoughts about Kubo. Of course, I want to take this opportunity to introduce that to you um, and kind of um, in mix in my thoughts like on the um, presentation with some of our experiences in the startup community today. So I'm not sure if you guys have seen the like startup on Net, um, Netflix. This is like a newly acquired hobby for me to watch K-dramas, I guess. But I think it's a it's a good briefer into um, what types of companies or startups we are working with or discussing when we think about tech startups vis-a-vis um, -vis like a traditional MSME and how they're being impacted by um, these laws. So anyway, a quick um, segue there. But in any case, like let me take this opportunity to introduce you to Kubo. It's actually not like QBO or QuickBooks Online. It's a, it's a Bahai Kubo. So it's the hopefully the Filipino equivalent of the Silicon Valley kind of garage. Um, and it stands for Bayanihan and Teamwork. Um, and, you know, we're essentially like, a, it's a public private initiative actually. It was started um, oh, just over four years ago, um, involving 
um, idea space, um, the Department of Trade and Industry, Department of Science Technology, as well as JP Morgan. And now we have, you know, many more partners that have um, joined hands with us in this initiative. And we're uh, stage agnostic, meaning, you know, from very early stage companies to, you know, startups that are beginning to scale up. Um, you know, we work across stages and sectors. Um, we have sort of three core mandates, right? Like the first is to grow the startup community. And again, you're all invited to participate in, you know, if you're interested in tech startups, please do join Kubo. Um, it's also to, to develop Filipino startups. Again, over our, just about 500 startups now that are part of this community and um, collaborate with the broader ecosystem. Just some of the programs under each pillar, like this really ranges from in the grow, right? Like road shows in schools, in um, various places, both physical and now virtual, um, you know, networking events, right? For developing startups, we have programs that can be as short as like sort of one, two day workshops and boot camps, all the way to kind of full fledged year long accelerator programs. Um, and in terms of collaborating with the ecosystem, you know, again, putting together, you know, events just such as Philippine Startup Week and even enabling other enablers, right? So through our, let's say, technology business incubator program, working with the DOST and several um, universities around the Philippines. Um, and yeah, our big vision at Kubo is really this. It's Filipino startups changing the world. We want to create, you know, like these huge impactful tech companies that were created by and for right, Filipinos to change the world. Um, but yeah, like, so I guess I'll jump into the reaction part now. So I guess this, if you want to have a broad look at what the tech startup ecosystem looks like today, there are just under a thousand, like I'd say, like sort of really tech based startups that are actively operating in the Philippines currently. That's not, I mean, it's not a tiny number, but I think in the region, it's, you know, definitely not as big as it potentially could be. Um, relatively lower also, again, comparatively um, in terms of, um, you know, venture capitalists and angel investors, but also, you know, like the domestic market is considered, you know, very, very promising, right, um, in that sense. And, you know, and more and more sort of activity and participation coming from the universities also and government as mentioned by Lars as well. Uh, um, and again, people kind of are excited about the potential in tech startups in the Philippines, largely because of the, again, the, the availability of domestic market. And we're also kind of known to be internet obsessed, right? Supposedly we spend the most time on social media, for example, in versus anywhere in the world. And the availability of talent is definitely another thing that is kind of working to, to, to our advantage. So that's the opportunity. And this was, I saw some version of this slide, like when I, the, around the year that I started Kubo, which really kind of got me thinking, right, about the potential of this sector. You know, if you think about the, just at the time, right, the top five sort of tech companies in the US, like um, in Silicon Valley, right, they're, combined sort of revenues in, in one year was like more than double the GDP of the entire Philippines. So the thought was, you know, if, and these were all, none of these were kind of inherited legacy hundred year old companies, right? These were all kind of largely considered to be startups, you know, founded by one or two people kind of thing and really using technology. And this, this number is even bigger today, right? Like, you know, there's one kind of company with market cap, like several trillion dollars. But anyway, um, I guess the point is, you know, if we just need to make one here, right, and that could have huge kind of impact and potential. And you're already starting to see it in the region, right, with the giants like Grab and stuff like that, um, really kind of, you know, dominating several um, spaces. Looking specifically at the Philippines, right, I, I think it's very interesting that the specific sectors identified by Attorney Serzo on you know, where there might be kind of potential gaps in regulation or <laughs> ambiguity, right? Also kind of closely match the, also the industries that are most um, promising and, you know, have the most number in terms of even volume, right? Of startups that are operating these spaces. Um, I do want to, and, you know, like, I just want to kind of reinforce the thought that the regulation does matter a lot, right? Like I would say like the Philippines is considered a leader in fintech like we have so many really promising fintech companies that have flourished here and i think that's largely you know that that can be attributed to this perception of like a good um kind of regulator and like that a similar thing can also i mean it can both it, it can definitely work both ways right like 
Um, whereas perhaps uncertainty in terms of foreign ownership and like, you know, things like that in areas like media and um, advertising um, can also dampen potentially like interest or, you know, the progress of startups in particular space. So, you know, like this does matter, right? Like it's not just, um, you know, re regulation, it really does almost directly translate to the, the numbers we're seeing each year of startups starting in a particular industry. So um, I guess I just wanted to mention that. Um, and of course, like the startup industry isn't immune to um, COVID, right? Like it's been badly affected as well. But at the same time, I think the one of the beauty um, or fate of among startups, right, is this idea that they can pivot quickly, that they respond quickly. And this was also something that we actually observed directly when the pandemic hit, you know, within three months, we saw that, you know, cl close to half of the startups had already kind of launched a new product or service that either directly addressed COVID or sort of um, pivoted their model to continue to be relevant. And I think this is something that, you know, we should pay attention to in terms of, um, you know, we need to, I mean, we don't have a huge base of tech startups to begin with, and we need to kind of try to provide immediate sort of support, right? Um, and the agility and the ability of, uh, you know, favorable kind of government inter intervention and policies to help make sure that we continue to support our startups and help them sort of stay alive or thrive even, right? Um, could really make a difference in what happens after the pandemic. So, and, you know, there's a, really good um sort of paper on this also like that um i'd encourage you to check out but i think even from our own experience you know we do see that the digital and these platforms right is is a space that is continues to grow like even in spite of like all the craziness that's happening and maybe in fact has accelerated because of it um and the outlook is quite strong right for the, for this particular sector um and Again, these are things that were perhaps many of you like the, I mean, the fact that we're kind of doing this whole conference um, in this platform, right, is, you know, a very concrete example, but, you know, everything from how you get your food, right, to how you learn, you know, how you stay fit, how you transact, you know, like everything has sort of in some ways kind of migrated to a lot of, has begun to migrate to these platforms. And we expect that that will continue even after, you know, hopefully we all get vaccinated and kind of move on with our lives. Um, and yeah, like, I, I think this was another point that was touched on by attorney Ceruzo, right? Like the, this, um, a lot of these perceptions really affect like, and you know, it's really a, a big challenge really has been um, access to capital and, close and the close second has been this at least the perception right of like um regulatory challenges in operating or just kind of starting or growing a digital kind of platform in philippines um i think yeah we did improve i think we beat me and harv like by now but uh, you know still right like considering that it's the second largest sort of market in southeast asia um for sure like the, there's opportunity still to improve um, so yeah, like that's the five minute chime. So I will, so like, I guess these are my kind of like, like closing thoughts. Um, definitely the innovative startup app and just the mere idea that, um, you know, innovation has become kind of a core consideration, right? It's something that has been a huge signal and help to the industry. Like we're, I think we're only now really seeing this year, right? Like with, um, very concrete sort of measures that are, you know, helping startups, right? Um, but, you know, it's definitely a step in the right direction to signal not just to like the startup founders themselves, but also, you know, potential investors that this is something, you know, that will be top of mind is by itself already very, very helpful. Um, and we're very, we're, the industry, I think is super looking forward to seeing how like the, the intent rights rolled out. Um, and then I guess these are sort of my other thoughts. I think one thing is, you know, communication is really important. You know, um, in, in some cases, I think there's already stuff that exists that's like actually pretty good. But, um, you know, it's about improving also the utilization, let's say, of certain incentives, right? Like, you know, many people in the startup community aren't even aware that they can, let's say, take advantage of certain things, right? Or how to do it, like, 
how to actually go about it, right? Like, um, you know, so streamlining existing kind of policy, sort of just really just laying it out and talking about it, right? Versus necessarily the gap or the need for new um, policies and regulations, um, I think is just something to really think about. You know, again, keep it simple, make it like sort of accessible, right? And not considered a hassle to kind of make yourself compliant. I think that's kind of important. Um, I also, the other thing that is, I guess, you know, it, from a government policy perspective, you know, leading by example, like by using startup services, you know, like I think there's a, there's kind of a bias against like new companies, right, generally. But, um, you know, if we like in, I, I see many good examples here of, you know, in other countries, right, where it's actually the government itself that, you know, spearheads or uses or promotes, right, like the locally developed kind of platforms. So, and that's something that I think we should look at. Um, and again, you know, perception is a really big thing, you know, versus reality, right? And I, unfortunately, I do still feel like there's a gap, like there's a perception both among founders and, you know, abroad investors, right, that there's, it's, there's a lot of friction to operate in the Philippines and therefore, you know, let's domicile your company elsewhere. So again, <laughs> communication, right? Um, and, and this affects also, I guess, talent. Um, you know, the brain gain is super important. Like, I think the lifeblood of like the tech startup industry is really about attracting like the brightest minds, right? To kind of try to work on these things. And we want more, we want to encourage, right? Like our Filipinos that are successful, like anywhere in the world, right? To kind of come back and start their companies here, see the opportunities here. And, you know, the biggest unicorns in Southeast Asia, a lot of them did come from kind of a global diaspora, right? So, you know, if you're thinking about Anthony Tan or like, you know, Nadim from Gojek and all these guys, right? So that's one, communication. I have, I guess, three points. Um, the second thing is, um, and I'll try to do this faster. Yeah, like, you know, again, great intentions, I think, in a lot of these cases, but, um, and, you know, again, I want to just make sure I'm clear that I'm recognizing and grateful for like a lot of the efforts that are being done already. But, you know, certainty, clarity, consistency, this is really important, um, especially for attracting investment. I think there's a lot of fear all the time that maybe the, you know, regulations will change, right? And this is, and especially in an industry where things, you know, like a startup is almost encouraged, right, to quickly pivot, to switch around, like what they're doing to respond to like kind of market demand. Um, the, you know, like this perception again of, you know, that there's some kind of baseline certainty that, you know, your license, you're not suddenly going to become illegal. Like, I think I know what, I think there's an example that comes to mind there, right? Um, you know, is important. Um, second, like, you know, I third rather um, foreign, can be isn't a bad thing necessarily when done right. I know the intent again is maybe to protect local industry, right? But you know, it it is helpful actually sometimes, you know, to attract foreign talent for for example, to as long as they're setting up here, they're creating jobs here, they're, you know, developing talent here, like paying taxes here, right? Like um we shouldn't be like averse to it, I would say. It can be a it can be a force for good if it's done correctly. And I think generally like Hopefully, I think this is the wish list. Oh, sorry. Like one, I'll have one last slide after this. Um, I hope you don't mind. Um, uh, it's like, um, yeah, like let's please try to remove friction. I think, um, you know, let's not try to predict what's gonna happen. You know, we're not. I wish I knew everything in the future, right? But, um, you know, like instead of trying to anticipate everything that could possibly happen, right? I think the kind of trying, trying to remove barriers as opposed to kind of over prescribing, I think is generally, um, you know, a good thing. And last but not the least, you know, I think it's important to have like speed and bias for action in all of these things. Um, I think it's in particular for this rapidly evolving kind of industry for us to be able to really maximize the gains, right? Like, let's not think five year plan, like, let's think, you know, what can we do today? And there are a lot of best practices already out there, uh, you know, like, especially, for example, in Singapore, right, where they really kind of paved the path. So, you know, we don't need to kind of think of a lot of these. Um, and yeah, especially for platforms, right? Like, you know, Execution is a lot of it also, right? Like it's not it's not just like specifically kind of IP that's important, but you know, how you're rolling it out, how the customer embraces it. And in order for us to compete in the region, that we should try to aim for like again a sort of level mm. playing field. Is there something else I can help with? Yep. And yeah, like um, 
you know, and last but not the least, right? The lean and frugal is supposed to be our startup mantra, but like, you know, we need real investment, funding, and support. Um, and in order to create a unicorn, right, to create that billion dollar company, you do need like you, you need to be able to scale up. And that's the I think that's the free that's the part now that we're we are struggling, right? We have a lot of great ideas, a lot of early stage companies, but we need to kind of unshackle them in order to get allow them to compete in the region and sort of scale up even beyond the Philippine borders. And that's kind of my final thought, really. Like, let's collaborate on this, like let's overcome like hey, you know, this, mindset and you know help our companies kind of grow from maybe in calabaos right and to unicorns um yeah and please join kubo so uh, i look forward to speak um you know like for the open forum later but thank you so much and thank you so much uh director um Kath katrina chan of kubo uh thank you very much for sharing your valuable insights on uh you know, um, importance of coherent uh, policies and incentives, importance of good messaging. Um, what else? Um, having a certain key clarity and, and, and consistency. Uh, actually, your, your slide on uh, the start of growth in, in COVID-19 was really is really um, um, a very good piece of, of news. And the um, the startups you mentioned there, some of them I use, so some of them I'm, I'm familiar with. Yeah, it's, it's very good to know. And as you've mentioned, digital platforms have uh, continued to grow uh, amid the pandemic and even accelerated during the during the pandemic. So we'll hear more from uh, Director Chan during the uh, open forum. So friends, moving on. If you recall, our, our topic delves on critical issues that may need or benefit from cross-border uh, cooperation or multi-country governance and regulation. And as such, we also invited an expert who could tell us about discussions in APEC and the WTO on e-commerce and the platform economy and any developments that he may, he, she could pos possibly share from this uh, negotiations. Our second discussion is the chief of the multilateral relations division of the Bureau of International Trade Relations of the Department of Trade and Industry, where she heads the APEC and WTO desk. She was DTI's coordinator for substantive issues during the APEC 2015 chairmanship of the Philippines and was the chairperson of the APEC Committee on Trade and Investment uh, in 2016 and 2017. She obtained her bachelor's degree from the University of the Philippines and his master's credits from the Ateneo de Manila University and Boston University. Good to have you again, Ms. Marie Sherilyn Akia. The floor is now yours. Thank you, Dr. Sheila. And good afternoon to everyone. Good afternoon to Vice President uh, Marife Balesteros, uh, to Katrina and all the guests. And thank you again to PIDS for this opportunity to participate in this web webinar. Thank you also to Attorney um, Lars for these two excellent papers. I'd like to start by uh, acknowledging the assistance of my colleagues in preparing the slides. We have two experts on e-commerce and digital trade at the Bureau of International Trade Relations. Uh, and uh, these are Marcy Tripp and Lorraine Dong. As you know, the BITR is the office at the DTI in charge of foreign trade relations, especially market access at the bilateral, regional, and multilateral level. So this presentation is really not just mine, but uh, all three of us. So we can go to the next slide. My presentation will cover uh, the general and the specific comments on the two studies. And as requested by the PIDS, I will also share some developments in APEC and the WTO. These are the two international engagements which we manage at the Multilateral Relations Division. Next slide, please. As general comments, uh, we find both studies to be useful in adding to the body of knowledge on digital platforms, especially how our laws and regulations may be relevant. As many of you know, digital platforms are an important business model now. This model is not new, but uh, with COVID-19, it has made us more aware of it, especially as a lot of us are a part of one or more, uh, plat uh, more of a platforms community, whether it's in uh, retail or business, in work, school, health, and other social applications. So the first study covers areas of innovation uh, e-transactions, finance, consumer protection, data privacy, among others. And the second study focused on data regulation for digital platforms. 
both studies they provided us an in-depth look at existing at the existing regulatory regime. The stock take and this review uh, certainly they will assist us in our current work of positioning the Philippines in e-commerce discussions, especially in international fora. DTI is responsible for digital economy issues and the broad range of topics that were covered in the two studies are actually part of the e-commerce discussions in our uh, that our office handles, not just e-commerce, but also other uh, areas like trade and services. Um, I think the important thing to say is that regulations are important, that they are designed to address certain objectives. And uh, that was also highlighted in one of the sites of Attorney Lars. At their best, they can capture value for many stakeholders, allowing us to benefit from the digital economy. And at their worst, only a few stakeholders can benefit. So we agree uh, that a review of current regulations is necessary, and we need to get rid of the bad regulation that stifles competition and inhibits innovation. And we also need to further improve regulation making where it can make markets work better. Next slide, please. For our more specific comments, uh, as it applies to the first study, I'd like to share some recent work underway at the DTI on improving the business environment for digital platforms. One is on the enactment of the ITA or the Internet Transactions Act. The ITA provides for an enabling regulatory environment and DTI is championing this bill. It uh, seeks to regulate commercial transactions on the internet to protect both consumers and sellers from fraud and abuses. Apart from tangible goods that are sold online, the law will also cover transactions in online travel services, digital media, ride hailing, and digital financial services. Um, the, the law will also allow the uh, establishment of an e-commerce bureau and uh, will also try to and will also protect consumers online by uh, putting in place an online dispute resolution mechanism. Um, another work is the Philippines ratification of the United Nations Electronic Communications Convention or the ECC. We signed on to the ECC in 2007. It is a treaty which allows signatories to facilitate the use of electronic communications in international contracts. The ECC seeks to strengthen harmonization of e-commerce rules and of foster uniformity in the domestic enactment of UNCITRAL model laws relating to uh, electronic commerce. So we're working to have this ratified this year and related to this work is the revision of the e-commerce act, which incidentally is modeled after the UNCITRAL model law on e-commerce. And this is already, the e-commerce act is more than 20 years old and we need to align it with the UN ECC and hopefully that will address the gap that attorney Lars mentioned on electronic contract contracting. Another work is on the e-commerce Philippines 2022 roadmap. Uh, Basta e-commerce madali, market access, digitalization, and logistics integration. We, we launched this roadmap in January 2022 this year, uh, 2021 this year. And the vision is centered on market access, digitalization, and logistics integration. It lays out the framework and the strategic directions for 22 strategies in 22 ag agenda items for 2022. So that makes it easier for us to remember. For instance, among the strategies uh, that are included are on creating a secure, reliable, efficient, and affordable network of ICT services, initiating an e-commerce logistics infrastructure and investment convergence program, and scaling up the digital transformation of micro and SMEs or MISMIs as we call them, especially in the light of COVID-19. So the e-commerce bureau of the Department of Trade and Industry will uh, be uh, the champion and uh, they will coordinate the implementation of the roadmap. And incidentally, the e-commerce bureau will be created when the uh, uh, Internet Transaction Act is enacted. So the fourth point leads me to my comments on the second study, which is our work to take advantage of the trade agreements that have been concluded by the Philippines, as well as our engagements in the discussions of next generation trade and investment issues, especially on digital trade, which I will discuss in the other slides. So next slide. Um, with respect to the second study on cross-border data privacy and security, I would like to share some information and in areas that we are working on now with the National Privacy Commission. I see that we have some uh, colleagues in the INPC, so hello to you, all of you. Why is the DTI giving attention to DTI uh, to, to data privacy and security? Well, simply because data privacy will help build trust that will support e-commerce and cross-border trade. 
So since 2019, we have worked with the NPC to join the APEC cross-border privacy rules system, CDPR. Uh, this is a government-backed data privacy certification that companies can join to demonstrate compliance with internationally recognized data privacy protections. We are one of the nine members in APEC, and right now the NPC is working to identify an accountability agent which will issue the uh, certifications for companies. Other work related to the APEC CBPR is uh, the delivery of capacity building and awareness raising for businesses, including businesses and also consumers. To foster cross-border data protection beyond the Philippines, the NPC has signed a couple of uh, memorandum of understanding, uh, namely with the United Kingdom and Singapore, and both memoranda lay the basis for mutual recognition of laws, cooperation, and collaboration on data protection. So next slide. Um, I'd like to share some developments in APEC and the WTO on cross-border issues in e-commerce. Next slide, please. For participants who are not familiar with APEC, this uh, short 101, uh, it's a forum for facilitating economic growth, cooperation, trade and investment in the Asia-Pacific region. We have strong ties with the business through the APEC Business Advisory Council or APAC, and the uh, objective of course is to achieve greater prosperity for all the people in the region through trade and investment liberalization, business facilitation, innovation, and digitalization, as well as strong balance inclusive and sustainable growth. APEC is made up of 21 member economies and it's home to around 2.9 billion people representing approximately 60% of world GDP. And APEC region accounts for 47% of global trade in goods and commercial services in 2019. Next slide, just very quickly to show you how important APEC is to the Philippines. Our top five major trading partners and investors are APEC economies. Next slide. Um, so APEC is non-binding and it's an incubator of ideas. And this slide shows a timeline of several milestones reached in APEC on e-commerce and the digital economy. I'll not go into them into detail, but just to point out that as early as 1998, work on e-commerce already began in APEC. Following this, several initiatives were undertaken, particularly on data privacy. And then in the last five years, there was a strong focus really on the digital economy. So next slide, uh, there's two important initiatives in digital economy in APEC. Uh, the first one I already mentioned briefly and also attorney La Lars talked about it. This is the APEC CBPR, or cross-border privacy rules system. Um, as I said, nine members, uh, we joined last March, 2022. It's a system to build trust between uh, governments, regulators, businesses, and citizens. And attorney Lars, I think there was talk among Malaysians last year that they're going to look into joining the CBPR. So hopefully it will expand. And there's also active discussion to open it up to non-APEC members. Um, next slide. The second important initiative is the APEC Internet and Digital Economy Roadmap. Uh, it's very uh, uh, comprehensive. It focuses on areas such as digital infrastructure, innovation, uh, enabling technology and services, security, trust, use of ICTs, and the like. So. Uh, it's non-binding, it's principles-based, but it helped us in crafting some of our policies, including the Internet Transactions Act. Okay, next slide uh, is on the WTO. Um, to those who are also not familiar, WTO is a global international organization dealing with the rules of trade between nations. And its overall goal is to ensure that trade flows smoothly, predictably, predictably and freely. Next slide. Philippines is uh, among, um, in 2019, the top traders of goods and commercial services were mainly economies in North America. And the Philippines is the 38th largest trader with particular strength in other business services exports. So next slide. This is to show you that in terms of competitiveness in terms uh, in trade and in, in exports and imports were ranked 43 and 30, 43rd and 34th respectively among 164 members. And on uh, the top destinations of our products, they go to the US, Japan, China, Hong Kong, and the EU. All of them are WTO members. Next slide. Um, so in, uh, in the WTO, e-commerce is also a subject of discussion and negotiations. There are two tracks. Uh, the first is the work program on e-commerce, and the second is the joint statement uh, initiative on e-commerce. Next slide. Um, 
like APAC, WTO also had early work on e-commerce versus the Declaration on Global E-Commerce that was adopted in May 1998, where members agreed to uh, examine all trade-related issues taking into account economic, financial, and development needs of uh, countries. So uh, the most important thing to remember about this work on the e-commerce is our commitment uh, to not impose customs duties on electronic transmissions. So this is this moratorium is in force and it will be reviewed in June 2020. Next slide. Um, the second track is the JSI, the Joint Statement Initiative, which is led by a group of WTO members, um, mainly Australia, Japan, and Singapore. Participation is open to all members. Uh, they started the work to advance uh, e-commerce negotiations to come up with global rules on trade-related rela aspects of e-commerce. Uh, we joined in 2019, so we can make substantive comments and inputs on the text of the potential agreement. Whether we will sign on to this agreement will depend on the final draft. But I remember clearly when Secretary Lopez announced that we will join the JSI on e-commerce, that he was very keen for MISMIS or micro and SMEs to benefit from e-commerce and from any new rules on e-commerce. Next slide. But two of the major themes of the JSI negotiations relate to data privacy and consumer protection under the pillars on trust and cross-cutting issues. And the draft covers provisions on protection of personal information, business trust, cybersecurity, and online consumer protection. Data privacy is an important element in building trust among government, private sector, and consumers. And trust will promote business growth, innovation, and digital confidence, all of which will support a thriving digital economy. Okay, next slide. Um, let me wind down my comments by showing this slide. So the statistics here show that there's vast potential for growth for e-commerce in the country and the share it can contribute to the country's total trade. It also reflects the digitalization momentum that the Philippines can leverage on. If you look at the numbers, they may seem big, but if you relate that with the amount of time that an average Filipino spends on the net, and also the value of transactions, we have yet to really reach our peak on e-commerce. Indeed, um, um, Philippines has yet to fully utilize the benefits from the digital economy, not just on the obvious e-commerce side, but also the social value from a digitalized economy, such as education, health, uh, agriculture, and innovation. And one way we can do that is from the government perspe perspective is to adopt policies and regulations that will promote innovation while addressing the regulatory challenges. Many of our current policies are laws and competition, investment, education, consumer protection, IPR, and other areas. They were developed when platforms, when platforms were not yet a pervasive business model. Um, most of them were really directed towards traditional non-platform non linear model kind of businesses. So a deeper look into the laws and regulations is in order including how we can employ regulatory impact assessment as a tool when coming up with new reg regulations. And we, we need to take into account the different kinds of business models and uh, consider as well the networks and communities. You know, that's what, that's uh, a characteristic uh, unique to platforms. So they, they don't just affect the shareholder, mm -hmm. the capitalist, but also others like employees, consumers, the society, and uh, many other uh, stakeholders. So through an enabling policy environment, we can drive the digital economy, make it an important contributor to the country's growth and development. Okay, so last slide is um, sort of my wrap up. Firstly, that governments will need to have a more active role to ensure that the policies keep pace with technological developments. As technologies advance more rapidly and new business models are emer emerging, Cooperation between both the public and the private sector is essential. Um, this is really important because private sector, they're always ahead and government is always behind. So we need to really work together. Next is on international disciplines and rules and, and structural reform efforts. They play a crucial role to ensure our domestic policies are relevant and responsive to all stakeholders in the economy. And the global nature of the internet also calls for global approaches, whether it's in mm -hmm. rule making, in cooperation, or in mutual recognition of rules. So the formal rules, such as those in the WTO, they're relevant to ensure predictability. And then last point, uh, again, going back to my first point, collaborative role for the public and private sector will foster innovation and the increased adoption of digital tools and technologies to ensure a trustworthy enabling environment 
that will benefit all stakeholders. So with that, I end my presentation. Look forward to your questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lynn Aki of the BITR uh, Department of Trade and Industry. Thank you, Lynn, for the developments you shared um, in terms of uh, uh, international negotiations in the APEC and WTO uh, to address uh, issues in e-commerce and uh, digital platforms. The, these um, these fora and, and uh, the developments that you've shared with us really show um, that many countries are uh, are uh, viewing uh, digital platforms as uh, really an important area for for growth and development. And really, um, there should be global cooperation in uh, in 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 so so everyone can can reap uh, the benefits of uh, of. Uh, uh, this of new business models and of course of uh, technological um, innovations. Okay, so friends, uh, moving on before we proceed to the next part of our webinar, which is the open forum. And right now we don't have uh, any questions yet, I think, but feel free to type in your questions for, and also those who are watching us on Facebook, you are very much welcome to participate in the discussion. Just use the comment section. Um, on Facebook. So friends, um, let us give our speakers a short break before uh, the Q&A. And uh, let us have a poll. I think um, many are uh, waiting for our poll. So I hope you listen intently to the uh, presentation of uh, Dr. of uh, of uh, attorney Lars, because I am getting the question from her presentation. So here is our quest question for this week. So attorney Lars in her presentation mentioned several regulatory constraints that impede the growth of digital platforms in e-commerce in the country. And among those that she mentioned are electronic contracting issues, telecommunication restrictions. Uh, she also mentioned regulatory overlaps and data privacy regulations. Name another constraint, okay? And here are your choices. A, intellectual property rights. B, investment restrictions on foreign participation. And C, cybercrime. So is it A, B, or C? You have five seconds to answer. Just key in your answer, okay? Please key in your answer now. As our platform host is already uh, is already uh, already processing the results. Well, Web Webex I think needs at least twenty seconds now to process the results. Okay, is it ready? Okay, one minute, one second. Okay, now. Okay, so the answer is B. Okay, investment restrictions on foreign participation and 36 got it right. So for those who got it right, we will pick two winners. Um, and uh, we will, and, and each of them will receive a PIDS notebook. And I will announce the winners before we close the open forum. Okay, so friends, let us now proceed to the uh, open forum. And at this point, I invite uh, Attorney Lars, uh, Kath, and uh, Sherilyn for the questions. Let me, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, perhaps um, we can begin by, by uh, I'd like to get your, your uh, and this is for you, Attorney Lars. I think I, I mentioned this to you after your presentation that just recently, the, uh, the President certified three economic bills as urgent, no? And among these is the Public Service Act, the other two are uh, Foreign Investments Act and the Retail Trade Liberalization Act. How do you think will these bills, once they are enacted and implemented, could hasten the growth of e-commerce and uh, pl the platform in the economy in the country? And what challenges do, do you foresee uh, in the in implementation process? Attorney, any right. thoughts? Right. So I understand that these uh, three pieces of legislation, they're still bills. So yeah. none of them have uh, have been enacted yet into law. 
Uh, however, just based on the drafts that uh, I've seen, I think these uh, these bills uh, are a step towards the right direction when it comes to uh, addressing regulatory uh, gaps, which may impede the growth of digital platforms in the Philippines. So uh, as I think I mentioned this in, in my paper. Most of the restrictions actually have been unduly extended to platforms, although mm -hmm. these laws have been written decades ago. They've been unduly restricted to apply to platforms due to the language or the broad language, uh, like, for example, the Public Service Act, due to the broad definition there. So the way that the way to fix that, uh, of course, in the news or in, in Facebook, etc., we hear that there's a need to change the Constitution or mm. pass another law, pass regulations, etc. So I think this is a manifestation that the government agencies or in, and Congress have actually uh, looked into how they could uh, ease up on the restrictions, and that for the for the case yeah. of retail, uh, public service, transportation, etc., the way to solve this is really through amendment of the existing laws to make mm -hmm. it catch up with uh, the current context. So at least for those three, you don't really need to amend the constitution since the constitution right. just gives a very general language, right? Uh, you can just pass laws to correct that. So it's a it's definitely a welcome uh, development. Thank you, Lars. Um, Ms. Akia, Sherilyn, would you have uh, any thoughts? And then I will go to uh, Kat. I'm okay. I'm not very much an expert on the Public Service Act, but I do know that's something that we're really monitoring because it involves a lot on new, uh, our negotiations on, this, on trade and services. So mm -hmm. we're, we're really um, uh, waiting for, for the enactment of this bill. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, Marilyn. Um, Kat? I mean, same. I, I'm not particularly familiar with the provisions of the Public Service Act, but, you know, I think, again, anything that makes it, you know, like easier, especially, and, you know, like he sends, right, the delivery of like certain services, like for this industry is much needed right now. So I think anything that speeds things up would be super helpful yes. in general. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I, I have a question regarding Kubo. Uh, because you, you've mentioned there the different startups, uh, Philippine digital startups. But if let's say a, an entity wants to um, avail of the services, capacity building, technical, whatsoever mm -hmm. from Kubo, how does an entity join Kubo? Oh, uh, sure. I'm very <laughs> happy to plug. Um, you, so you just sign up on our website. Um, it's www.qbo.com.th. Um, so there's an interview process, but, you know, to verify that you're an actual tech startup um, mm -hmm. and but as a, and, you know, basically from there, it's free. Like we what we want to grow the community. We want people to be counted and to avail of these. Um, again, you know, I mentioned mm -hmm. communication in my presentation, right? We want people to make the most out of the, you know, different incentives and things like that that are being offered. So we definitely enjoin you if you're thinking about starting a tech company or you're already in that process, you know, please join mm -hmm. our community. Get some free legal advice from attorney Lars here. Like, um, yeah. <laughs> so attorney Lars is part of Kubo. Attorney Lars is also part of Kubo and Idea Space. We have a we have a partnership with Kubo since uh, 2017, see. right, Kat? So uh, our firm, our lawyers, uh, essentially me uh, and other lawyers, we do provide free consults for the Kubo startups. I see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Kath and, and Attorney Lars. No? So let us entertain some questions from our audience. Uh, we have a question here from Ellie Kureg of uh, the uh, Congressional Planning and, and Budget uh, Research uh, Department. What are the implications of our subscription to APEC cross-border privacy rules and the non-subscription of other uh, ASEAN countries? This uh, I, 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 this question is for you, Sherilyn, uh, uh, because as mentioned by um, Attorney Lars, no? There are other ASEAN countries that did not have that 
uh, have no intention to join such as Indonesia, but you, but for Malaysia, you said, um, yes, it has an intention to join, but Thailand, no, but Vietnam, no. So how will this affect um, developments in, in the international arena if there are some countries that uh, that are willing to join, but there are some countries that are not willing to join. Okay, um, thank you for that question, Dr. Sheila. And please call me Lynn, because Sherry lives Hi, Lynn. Long. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. Well, have, uh, being a part of the CVPR, it's, uh, it's actually a seal of privacy, compliance, and accountability. So, um, maybe just an example, for example, uh, if you have a CBPR certification, you don't have to obtain consent anymore to transfer data to another uh, CBPR member, which is required in some uh, jurisdictions. So it's like a mutual recognition. So that's uh, one. And um, mm -hmm. when they were also coming up with the CBPR, it was patterned after there were discussions with the EU eh, the, uh, and as you know, the the, the data privacy rules of the EU are really high up there. They're the global, uh, they're the gold standard. So most of the principles in the uh, uh, in the CBPR, as well as our own, of course, ano na din tayo, we're also uh, we also patterned our our law after the OECD and the GDPR. Um, it's uh, already a um, parang asa, a mark a mark of good compliance. Yeah. So uh, in, in a sense, you're able to transact uh, um, easily in terms of data with other countries, especially those within the group. So it's important na that they expand the membership para the, that recognition is also expanded. And that's useful for us because there's the U.S. who's one of the members, and a lot mm -hmm. of our uh, DPOs are uh, American companies. So I that's see. useful for us. Okay. Thank you very much, Lynn. Okay. Let us entertain other questions. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, there's a question here from Joseph Solis Alcaide, although I think this has already been answered by Doctor uh, by Attorney Lars when I asked her about her remarks on the uh, the three bills that have been certified urgent by the president. Are you advocating for a constitutional amendment to ease or repeal these investment restrictions in the 1987 uh, Constitution? And I think Lars. Uh, yeah, uh, as you mentioned, recently. there is no need, no, because yeah, I mean, just the passage of these bills could could ease up, could could hasten. Um, yes, yes, Lars. Yes. Uh, so at least for the for the issues that we've identified in the in the presentation, mass media, uh, retail, retail, public utilities, mm -hmm. uh, all of the restrictions here actually could be addressed without constitutional amendment. Like so, for public utilities and retail, you just need a new law. Yes. For mass media, it's even easier. You just need because uh, the law, the laws, the existing laws, Consumer Act and Tobacco Regulation Act, it's limited to advertising messages. Mm -hmm. So, in order to remove platforms from the definition of mass media, uh, our mm -hmm. proposal is actually just for the SEC, the DOJ, or some executive agency to issue an opinion or maybe an EO or a statement stating or clarifying those past opinions. So mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. There, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Lars. Okay, another question for, uh, from Elizabeth Urhel of uh, the UANP. Any idea on how incoherent policies among various agencies' departments can be avoided or minimized? Perhaps uh, I can ask uh, Katrina first, Kat, no? from the standpoint of the private sector. In, in your view, how can, how can these incoherent policies be minimized? Um, I think, you know, like communication early on in the process needs to be implemented. I think there, I've observed that there's sort of silos in terms of who's implementing what. And there are many things that have come up, great ideas, right? But sort of 
implemented separately like from so i think well, the first step i think is even at the very beginning maybe you know coming together and then let's just put forward one set of like you know rules right or something like that um i think that's one important step too i would definitely also encourage communication again with mm -hmm. the stakeholders involved early on i mean i i mean of, of course there's even from a process perspective there's always a you know, data gathering process with stakeholders that happens, but I think this could be, this could be improved even further, right? And I guess the third thing I wanted to mention is, you know, at the end of the day, like startups, right? Her businesses, they they don't start companies because of the regulation, right? Like improving policy or regulation won't make you decide that this is a business I want to pursue. So right. at the end of the day, it should be sort of a background or kind of something that you know, enables things versus, um, yeah, like no no amount of, you know, good policy or whatever will make someone start a business there just because of it, I think, like in most cases. So, um, yeah, so I guess kind of coming at it from that lens, I you know, um, maybe, you know, like kind of stepping back a bit, it will also allow these organizations to kind of minimize, right? Like kind of the number of conflicting or um, what have you regulations and policies. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Katrina. You. Um, Attorney Lars, uh, would you have anything to add? I think in your in your presentation, you, mm -hmm. you mentioned some policy considerations, some policy yeah. suggestions, yeah. Uh, so just to build up on what Kat said, because actually uh, most of the most of the studies that we've done or the the papers actually inspired by our experience with Kubo and Kubo startup. Mm, and okay. just to just to add to what she said, I think uh, it's also important for which I think regulators are doing now to take a lighter touch approach when it comes to regulations. Like instead of providing specifics, so this is from the lens of a, a, a lawyer. Uh, and from my work with the UP Law Center, instead of providing specific rules in, uh, in let's say the lo the law itself, uh, maybe providing more flexibility to the regulation to the regulators who are actually on the ground and who presumably uh, has the expertise and know how when it comes to the industries or the activities that they seek to regulate, and also encouraging uh, interactions or communications among the. Uh, regulators, like uh, I know for a fact that the financial regulators uh, actually do this regularly, like whenever there's a policy question or uh, a new uh, area to be regulated, they meet and talk about it. So I think that's SEC, BSP, the Insurance Commission. So they have that. So maybe replicate that for other agencies uh, that are also involved when it comes to startup regulations. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Lars. Um, allow me to read um, to prioritize the questions for uh, for uh, Kath, for uh, Director Shan, as she needs uh, to leave by uh, at the latest for four o five, right, Kath? So I have another question for you, and this is from uh, Karma Ortiz. Although I think this has been covered in your presentation. Um, she asked, were there challenges faced by startups during the COVID pandemic, particularly in terms of access to funding? Based on this, is there a need to come up with policies to cushion the negative effects of this disruptors on these small industries? Kat? Yes, definitely. I mean, um, funding was, in, it's tight, right? Like everyone's, you know, cost cutting, you know, you're not necessarily looking to, you know, innovate or expand or something like that, especially when you're in a difficult situation such as the one we've faced. So absolutely, like, um, you know, like there is a need, right, both in the rescue side, I guess, you know, just kind of stem the bleeding, make sure that they kind of stick around and also to support, right, like whatever pivots the startups need to make to continue mm -hmm. to be competitive because we are, you know, eh, you know, never let a good crisis go to waste, right? Like most of the big, you know, the big tech companies we know today are actually kind of usually post some financial crisis, dot com burst, right? So we know that um, after this, like a new breed, you know, a new set of companies are definitely going to emerge. The question is like whether they are going to be coming from the Philippines, right? And whether it's our companies that can take these positions. So they need the help now so that they're well 
you know, they're in a position to be able to compete as we kind of emerge and bounce back, right? So, yeah. Okay. Other questions? Uh, there is a follow up question here from Ellie Correg. Uh, remember, she asked us uh, a while ago about the uh, ASEAN uh, cross border privacy laws. And he asked, authorities also mentioned that that most consent forms are long and not easy to understand. What can we do in ensuring that consent based privacy paradigm for digital platforms will not be abused or that's or that its implementation be better improved? Can we follow the Apple privacy model instead, which simplifies which private in info will be used and in what manner? Um, attorney Zerso. Huh. Okay. So I mean, don't get me wrong, the regulations requiring consent and requiring all this granularity when it comes to disclosures. Uh, so that's a good thing. Uh, mm -hmm. However, I think the solution there is really just for the regulator to encourage controllers and processors to couch their consent forms in a readable like human language aside from legalese. So you can have mm -hmm. a legalese version of your consent form, but have a human readable, a human readable consent form, right? Uh, not just for the lawyers. So, yeah, so I think you can solve that through like maybe issuing best practices, guidelines, etc. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Attorney Sir. So, actually, I have, I have a question uh, with regard to our privacy law. How do you think can we make it more responsive to this pandemic? I ask this because the amount of contact tracing forms that we'll fill out either let's say electronically or manually, whenever we visit establishments is, I think it's massive, no? Are these forms sure. being processed? Would you have any idea? I heard yeah, I don't think, I don't think any person was contacted through those forms yet. I yeah, only contacted yeah. one person who found That's out right. they had COVID Be through those Because forms. I heard that one of the restrictions to have these forms uh, serve their purpose is our privacy law. However, if you will recall, because you, you were, uh, one of the uh, panelists or speakers in our uh, APPC webinar last September, it was the privacy commissioner himself who said that we should be able to fully uh, maximize the beneficial use of personal data to fight this pandemic. And one way to mm -hmm. do that is to make use of the data do, that we provide for effective con contract tracing. So, in that okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I think that that's right. We definitely have a bunch of data that we're not using properly. Uh, in terms right. of the law, I think the data privacy, the regulation is there. Right? It's, I think, a matter of communicating it and implementing it properly. Uh, because under the law, actually, yes, you can collect data for contact tracing purposes, but the amount that you collect and the way that you process it should be consistent with that purpose. Now, I've seen some contact tracing forms that collect, like, in, even information that's not relevant for contact tracing, like birthday, uh, I don't know, like specific home addresses, uh, etc. So uh, for the pandemic, I think like government LGUs and other government uh, agencies, as well as the private sector, just, they just has they just have to be more mindful uh, mm -hmm. about what's required of them from the law and why we have these in place. So mm -hmm. uh, it's important to collect data, but we must always be aware of the purpose as to why we're collecting collecting them, and make sure that it's aligned. Because uh, you also don't want so much data floating around and then there's a chance for breach and then it might fall into the wrong hands, etc. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, Lynn has, uh, has a, would like to say something, Lynn, go yeah, ahead. Because I've attended so many data privacy seminars of, I know, <laughs> and heard uh, Commissioner Liboro is our, I know, our favorite uh, speaker at the DTI. That's right. and one thing oh. that uh, he always says is, don't collect what you cannot protect. And mm -hmm. in this case, it applies not just to private sector, but also the government because the, our data privacy act covers not just private sector, but also the government. So if there's any data breach, uh, then we can also run after the government. Mm -hmm. So that's important. Yeah. Mm -mm -mm -mm. And another great. thing is also yung, uh, what we call data minimization, only collect what we need. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Yeah. You're right. Right. Yeah. I think recently, much. yeah, sorry, recently just to build on what uh, Ma'am Lin said, the NPC came out with, I think not just one advisory, but like a, an advisory reminding the public, both government and private, uh, to be careful with the contact tracing forms, as well as the publication of 
uh, constituents who received ayudas. Because I think LGU started publishing like the names or the complete address of their residents online, which is mm. quite, I mean, that's dangerous and quite harmful if it falls uh, in the wrong hands. And that's I think fine. there was also a practice from LGUs where they publish the names and addresses of people who are positive. And parang presumably the intention is so that people are informed. However, uh, you end up having uh, people who are sick, who are now being stigmatized by their neighbors, etc. So, ayun. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, entertain other questions. Uh, incidentally, uh, Director Chan already stepped out of uh, the meeting room. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kath. It, uh, we hope to, see, to have you again in our future seminars here at Piet. The ideas. Uh, maraming salamat, ED Chan. Okay, we still have uh, several questions. And um, okay. Okay, this is something oh, sayang na wala na si ano, si, si ED Chan. Okay. Um, but Lars, I, I, I think you can, uh, I'd like to get your comment on this. Which regulatory agency in the Philippines covers domain name protection, such as in a scenario where there are cyber attacks to relinquish domain, domain name? So the domain name is Filipino owned, but the domain host is in a platform of a non-Philippine territory, such as GoDaddy. Mm -hmm. This question is from Jezrina Morales. Uh -huh. I apologize. <laughs> Not an expert in this in this field, but uh, primarily, if you're talking about, let's say, your IP rights over the dom domain, that's something you can protect uh, as a trademark with the IPO. Uh, but if I remember correctly, uh, domain name disputes could be brought to an international body. I forget the name, uh, and could be resolved there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have other questions. Interesting questions here. Okay, uh, from Arnel Almaden, is legislative or regulatory front running a correct observation of the country, preempting and stunting the evolution of startups? Uh, unfortunately, uh, but but any of you can may have thoughts on this, uh, Lars. See, uh, I'll take this first. I think. That's a fair assessment, but I don't think it was intentional on the part of the legislators and the regulators for, for this regulation to be sort of preemptive and to to be characterized as uh, ex ante. I think it's it's just a logical consequence of the fact that we have laws from mm -hmm. 1930s, 1940s, from the 80s that are still, yeah. I mean, the laws are, are valid until you say that they're not, until Congress repeals them or amends them. So, uh, in a way, it became preemptive. However, we can see uh, that government is working towards solving these issues. And mm -hmm. I think there's an acknowledgement naman that regulation should not be preemptive and should be supportive of innovation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much, Lars. Uh, there, there is a com comment here that was uh, shared by uh, uh, Joseph Solis Al Al-Qaeda al See, Perhaps, Lynn, you can... You can uh, you may want to share your thoughts on this. Sabi niya, if our country wants to join into next generation free trade agreements like the CPTPP or a bilateral FTA with the European Union, they always demand that before we accede to these next gen FTAs, we need to do a constitutional amendment to repeal restrictive foreign direct investment equity ownership restrictions in the constitution because the national treatment clause is stipulated in this FTA, especially CPTPP. TPP or formerly TPP that demands foreign investors be given the same treatment as local investors like 100% equity ownership of investments. Hey, would you like to, uh, you know, to comment on this? Yes, sure, uh, Dr. Sheila. Uh, first of all, uh, when we go into negotiations, we do not make down payment. So if you mm. say that we, before we accede to uh, an FTA, we, they would demand from us. We don't, we, we will, of course, not agree to that. Right? Of course, That's a function yeah. of the negotiations that comes during uh, the negotiations. And uh, and for one, I think just a personal comment, the Constitution is not negotiable. It's not for us at the DTI to negotiate on. Yeah, If we do um, reform or amend certain laws, it's because we need to do it, not because of any particular FDA. 
unless uh, you're talking about yung mga what happened in the WTO when we became a member, we had to uh, come up with the Anti-Dumping Act and so forth. But I don't see any particular FTA right now that we're going through that will make us want to touch the Constitution. When we face a, when we go into negotiations, we always tell them these are our restrictions. Ito yung constraints namin. And some of our, our of the partners, they understand that. So we just try to find a way to um, uh, at least uh, address kung ano man hinihingi nila. And if we can give it, then mm-hmm. we will in exchange for, of course, better concessions for us. But, but you know, the constitution, mahirap, mahirap talaga ay to touch that. Salamat, Lynn. No? Um, we are down to our uh, last uh, two questions. And this, uh, Lars, this is for you. You mentioned uh, as a policy consideration, the use of uh, encourage and make use of re- regulatory intersections. Can you expound on this? Uh, because we, we uh, there is a question here from from a Bayani San Juan. Uh, how can this approach be taken by existing regulatory agencies? Perhaps you can you can cite an example, probably. All right. Uh, so yeah. So the paper discourages like uh, regulatory organization wherein one regulator acts independent of all others. Uh, so that's that's not the approach that we're suggesting. So it's taking advantage of intersection. Because as mentioned, one product or one platform could be engaged in several activities that would definitely fall under different regulators. Uh, which for us is a good thing because one regulator can't be the expert in all. So let's say, for example, a platform that allows you to make payments and also allows you to book deliveries. So obviously that would fall under like minimum of two two regulators, right? So you have the BSP that would regulate payments and then the SEC that would regulate uh, logistics. So uh, yeah, so in that way, uh, the regulators could probably share insights or uh, know-how to one another in order to determine how to properly regulate a specific business model that would touch on both regulators' mm-hmm. jurisdiction. Mm-hmm. Uh, another, maybe a better example would be uh, how the BSP and the DTI regulations uh, developed when it comes to virtual credits virtual credits. So I'm talking about like in-game purchases. Let's say you can buy gems or tokens in an app, like in a game or in a social media platform. Uh, Technically, before the new regulations for virtual assets, uh, tokens could be classified as virtual currency. Uh, At the same time, it could be classified as gift credits. Mm -hmm. So now you fall under both the DT and the BSP, right? But the BSP Mm -hmm. requires you to get a license. So now you're not sure, like, do I need a license? Am I supposed to suspend my rollout? But uh, the recent uh, regulation from January this year, the BSP itself clarified in writing that virtual assets do not include in-game tokens or Mm -hmm. virtual tokens for games. So uh, that's one example where our regulators can gain from uh, like nourishing uh, overlaps and interactions. Thank you very much, Lars. I am reviewing uh, other questions uh, in our chat box, but these questions have been answered in, in our past uh, presentations, in our past webinars. So I, I encourage you to, to uh, check the recordings of our past webinars on the digital economy and platform economy. So at this point, uh, may I request uh, Sherry Lynn first for uh, some final remarks before we close the open forum, then I will call Attorney Lars. Sherry Lynn? Lynn? Um, no final thoughts, but to thank you again for inviting me here and to thank Attorney Lars for that very exhaustive and comprehensive, uh, the two papers. They will help us in our work. And hopefully we will see more of these kinds of papers uh, from the PIDS and from other um, experts. So thank you once okay. again. Lynn, if I may have one final question from an FB viewer, I think this is for you. Uh, this one is from Nora Park. No Discussions on regulating digital economy in different international fora are focused on 
international regulatory cooperation with the legal framework of the country, do you think we are open and capable of participating in IRCs to bear, better regulate the digital economy? I think we are if we are to continue yung the best practices in coming up mm -hmm. with regulations. Like uh, I mentioned earlier, the regulatory impact assessment as a tool that's NEDA's uh, advocating and they're using it now. And then yung regulatory sandbox that the BSP, that's they right, the BSP. Oh. So um, if we continue to do that, those best practices, then we should be able to. And it will also benefit us eh, when we... Uh, join this uh, kinds of regulatory coherence and cooperation initiatives. And um, that's just, of course, one part of the, the discussions on digital economy. There's many, many other issues. And yeah. well, it will it will help come up with a, a good, uh, good law or good disciplines, global disciplines at least. Thanks again, Lynn, for uh, gracing our uh, webinar this afternoon and hope to see you again on our future virtual events, virtual or face-to-face -face in the future here at PIDS. Attorney Lars, maraming salamat. Final words. Uh, all right. Uh, so thank you, Sheila, and to the, the rest of uh, PIDS for organizing this and inviting us to talk about uh, digital platforms and regulations. And uh, thank you as well to uh, Ms. Lynn as well as to Kat for sharing their uh, insights and their reactions. Uh, these were very helpful and definitely very relevant. Uh, I think uh, the, the the message that I want to convey through the two papers is really just uh, how relevant and how crucial it is uh, for the development of innovation and for digital platforms that we have a regulatory framework and a regulatory environment that's supportive of such uh, innovation. And I think what's crucial is for uh, policymakers and regulators to continuously communicate and to uh, uh, acknowledge that regulatory reform is a continuous process. Uh, it, it shouldn't, it, it, it's not a one-time thing. Uh, of course, innovation will always be faster, uh, but there are tools and methods by which regulations could, could be more enabling than, than not for, for innovation. So I think that's, that's all. And thank you again. And thank you, Attorney Lars. Friends, please join me in thanking um, Attorney Lars Yerso of the UP Law Center and the CINI Law, Executive Director Katrina Chan of the Cubo Innovation Hub and Idea Space, and Ms. Sherilyn Aki of DTI's Bureau of International Trade Relations for the valuable insights that, that, that they shared with us this afternoon. Um, please stay safe, both of you, also, and also at our, uh, Director Chan, and we hope to have you again in our future events here at the IDS. Let us give all of them a big virtual clap. And friends, uh, well, we, we heard a very clear message from our discussion today, and this is the need to transform our regulatory environment into one that is supportive of technological advancements and new business models. We need to have a facilitative uh, regulatory system that fosters investments, promotes competition, and encourages innovations to flourish. The COVID-19 uh, pandemic has fast-tracked the country's digitalization journey, and we need to keep uh, the mo momentum going. And one way to ensure this is by having the right amount and the right kind of regulations. Regulations are essential for the proper functioning of, the, of an economy, but they should uh, facilitate growth, not stifle it. Okay, so at this point, uh, before we finally close, let me announce the two winners will receive a PIDS notebook. They are Diana Janice Gubot and Joanna Fonte. Okay, I repeat, Diana Janice Gubot and Joanna Fonte. You won in our webinar for today. So our team, the webinar team will contact you for the delivery of your prize. Okay. And friends, uh, we have some final reminders before we close. So you can access all the presentations from today's uh, webinar from the PIDS website. You can access the the full studies by Dr. La by Attorney Lars and also the copies of the uh, uh, our discussions presentations. Okay. Also, of course, uh, please regularly visit our website and social media pages. Thanks to our to those who uh, watched joined our webinar uh, via our Facebook uh, live stream and also who uh, tune in to uh, Twitter for the uh, 
uh, live tweets. Okay. And this April, we have two remaining webinars. Next week, okay, our two remaining webinars for April. Okay. Uh, next slide. Okay, on April 22, friends, next week we'll take a break from the digital economy. Punta naman tayo sa ibang topic. On April 22, we'll have, uh, we'll discuss uh, our assessment, the PIDS assessment on national government support programs for LGUs, particularly focusing on our uh, water uh, programs on water service delivery. And on April 29, we'll have another webinar this time uh, uh, we will take a look at the country's expanded immunization program and primary health care for non-communicable diseases. And finally, we would like to thank uh, the various organizations, uh, uh, I mean the various representatives from government, academe, civil society, business, and international development community who joined us today. Okay, and friends, this concludes our webinar for this week. So stay safe, stay healthy, and stay informed too. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. See you next week.